Hello once again, criminal law students. Marahil ay marami na tayong napapanood sa TV o sa internet kung saan yung mga magnanakaw matapos mahuli ay binubugbog at kinukuyog ng taong bayan bago dalhin sa presinto o sa barangay. Or yung mga gumagawa ng kalaswaan o mga nanghihipo sa public place matapos silang mahuli ay binubugbog. Or kagaya na lang sa mga by bus operations or sa mga raids. Yung mga sospek na lumalaban ay pinapatay. Ngayon, sa mga examples ba na to, sa mga instances na to, yung mga nambumbog ba o yung ating kapulisan na pumapatay ng sospek dahil sa nanlaban, can they invoke the justifying circumstances under Article 11 like self-defense, defense of a relative, or defense of a stranger? Or can they invoke fulfillment of a duty? or exercise of a right. Malalaman natin ang sagot dyan sa video na ito. Sa video na ito, we will discuss justifying circumstances under Article 11. Now, what are the circumstances that affect criminal liability? We have JEMA or JEMAA, justifying, exempting, mitigating, aggravating, and alternative. At sa isang video po na ginawa natin, we also learned about absolutory causes and extenuating circumstances. And we mentioned Now, these are also circumstances which can be found elsewhere in the Revised Penal Code that also affect criminal liability. What are justifying circumstances under Article 11? Justifying circumstances are those where the act of a person is said to be in accordance with law. So yung ginawa ng tao na yon ay naayon sa batas. At dahil naayon siya sa batas, that person is deemed not to have transgressed the law. Wala siyang nilabag na batas. At dahil naman wala siyang nilabag na batas, There is no criminal and civil liability. Kasi only a person who is criminally liable is civilly liable. But this rule is not absolute. Meron pong exception. And that exception can be found in paragraph 4 or yung tinatawag nating state of necessity. Sa state of necessity po, merong civil liability. Not necessarily yung tao na gumawa ng act, kundi yung tao na nakinabang sa sitwasyon. We will learn more about that when we reach paragraph 4. What are the justifying circumstances under Article 11? There are six paragraphs. At para po mas madaling matandaan, ito po sila. Self-defense, defense of relatives, defense of a stranger, state of necessity, fulfillment of duty, and obedience to an order. Now let's start with paragraph 1 or self-defense. Anyone who acts in defense of his person or rights, provided that the following circumstances concur. First, second, and third. So meron pong tatlong circumstances at kailangang present sila lahat para magkaroon ng self-defense under Article 11. Kapag hindi po sila kumpleto, wala pong self-defense as a justifying circumstance. Pero meron naman tayong tinatawag na incomplete self-defense provided present ang isa or dalawa sa kanila. We will learn more about incomplete self-defense and how it affects criminal liability later on in this video. The first element in self-defense under paragraph 1 is unlawful aggression. This is the most important element of self-defense. Now, there are two kinds of aggression. We have lawful aggression and unlawful aggression. Ang example po ng lawful aggression ay itong sa doctrine of self-help under Article 429 of the Civil Code. The owner or lawful possessor of a thing has the right to exclude any person from the enjoyment and disposal thereof. For this purpose, he may use such force as may be reasonably necessary to repel or prevent an actual or threatened unlawful physical invasion or usurpation of his property. Dito sa lawful aggression, it refers to the force na ginamit ng may-ari para pigilan at pagbawalan ng ibang tao na kunin ang property niya or pakialaman ang property niya or i-dispose ang property niya. And that is an example of a lawful aggression. The right of the owner or the lawful possessor of the thing to exclude any person from the enjoyment and disposal of his property. At para i-exercise niya yung right na yon, kailangan niyang gumamit ng force para pigilan ng ibang tao. Does this mean na kapag merong nakialam sa property mo, pwede mo silang saktan or pwede kang mag-employ ng violence sa kanilang person para pigilan sila? For example, kung merong magnanakaw, does that mean pwede mo siyang patayin kung ninakaw niya yung halimbawa cellphone mo or motor mo? Defense of property is not of such importance as the right to life. And defense of property can only be invoked when it is coupled with some form of attack on the person of one entrusted with said property. The defense of property, whether complete or incomplete, to be available in prosecutions for murder or homicide, must be coupled with an attack by the one getting the property on the person defending it. So according po kay Justice Gutierrez, kailangang merong threat 
sa person mo. Merong threat sa life mo. Aside from the threat of dispossession na may kukuha ng property mo. So sa case po ng halimbawa sa murder or homicide, syempre napatay mo yung tao na yon. Kasi ang sinasabi mo, pinakialaman niya yung gamit mo or ninakaw niya yung pag-aari mo. So in order to validly claim self-defense in cases of murder at homicide, kailangan mong i-prove na merong imminent attack o merong actual attack sa person mo at hindi lang sa property mo. Sa kaso na to ng People versus Narvaez, yung may-ari ng property, nakagising siya kasi merong nangingi alam ng property niya. Kasi yung mga tao na yon nagpapatayo ng fence within his property. Ang ginawa niya, binaril niya yung dalawa sa kanila and namatay. And the question is, meron ba siyang right na patayin yung dalawa? Sa case na to sinabi ng Supreme Court na merong unlawful aggression. Kasi nga, pinakialaman yung property niya. Yung mga namatay, they destroyed or caused damage to his property. Pero sinabi din ng court na nag-exceed na siya sa right niya. Yung force na ginamit niya is sobra na sa kinakailangan para pigilan sila sa pag-destroy ng property niya. Let's proceed to the other kind of aggression which is unlawful aggression. Unlawful aggression is an assault or at least a threatened assault of an immediate and imminent kind. An actual physical assault upon a person or at least a threat to inflict real injury. So kung mapapansin nyo sa definitions, merong dalawang klase ng unlawful aggression. And these are actual and imminent. Now what is actual unlawful aggression? In actual unlawful aggression, the danger is present. That is, it is actually in existence. So there is an actual physical assault upon your person nangyayari na. While A and B were cutting trees, they had a heated argument. A suddenly slashed B with a bolo, thereby wounding B's right shoulder. A was about to deliver another blow, but B was able to retrieve his bolo and hacked A's stomach. A fell down and died a few moments later due to blood loss. So dito, merong actual physical attack sa person ni B. Since the attack is already happening, meron siyang right to defend himself, si B. And he is defending from an actual unlawful aggression. Next, we have imminent. The danger is on the point of happening. Sa actual, the physical assault is happening. There is an actual attack upon your person. Pero sa imminent, wala pa. Mangyayari pa lang. It is on the point of happening. For example, A and B were enemies. And in numerous occasions, B threatened A that he will kill him when their paths will cross. One night, while A was coming back home, he saw B heading towards him. B had a gun, and he pointed the gun at him. A, who was also armed with a gun, swiftly drew out his pistol and shot B. So sa example na to, si B, babarilin niya pa lang si A. Papunta pa lang siya, and he was already pointing his gun. Pero, hindi niya pa nakalabit ang gantilyo, mas mabilis si A. Kasi bumunot si A ng baril at binaril siya to defend himself. That is now the distinction between actual and imminent. Sa actual, yung physical assault ay nangyayari na. Ina-attack ka na. It is already happening. Sa imminent, hindi ka pa ina-attack. Ia-attack ka pa lang. The physical assault is about to happen. It is at the point of happening. And that is very important kasi dapat sa imminent, by all indications, talagang ia-attack ka na. It is about to happen. Kasi kung, for example, bumunot lang ng baril or nagpakita lang ng kutsilyo para takutin ka just to threaten you, then that is an example of grave threat or other light threat. Hindi naman talaga niya intention na manakit, kundi manakot lang. At kapag manakot lang siya, then you cannot employ force. Kasi sa self-defense, kailangang merong actual attack upon your person or an imminent attack upon your person. Again, unlawful aggression is one of the three elements or requirements that must be present so that a person can invoke self-defense. There are important things or reminders that we need to remember when it comes to unlawful aggression. Number one, there must be actual physical force or actual use of weapon. So, kailangang merong physical force na involved or merong paggamit ng weapon. Second, insulting words, no matter how objectionable, without physical force, does not constitute unlawful aggression. So, kapag merong nag-aaway at nag-aalitan, kapag nagpapalitan sila ng hurtful words, masasakit na salita or insulting words, wala pang unlawful aggression doon. At hindi mo pwedeng suntukin o saksakin o barilin yung kaaway mo. Kasi kapag verbal lang ang kanilang pagtatalo at hindi physical, wala pang unlawful aggression doon. A slap on the face constitutes unlawful aggression. So bakit ganito? Bakit ang pagsampal sa muka ng isang tao ay considered as unlawful aggression? Kasi your face represents your person 
and your dignity. At kapag sinampal yung mukha mo, it's an insult to you. It's a disrespect on your person. At parang niyurakan yung pagkatao mo. That's why it is considered as an unlawful aggression. Fourth, retaliation is not self-defense. Ang paghihigante, hindi siya self-defense. For example, while A was walking along the street one night, B approached him from behind and punched the back of his head. B kicked him continuously until A fell down. B took A's cell phone and wallet and ran away. On his way home, A saw B eating balot outside a store. A picked up a large stone and bashed it against B's head. B was hospitalized for three months. So sa example na to, merong unlawful aggression sa part ni B. Kasi nung ninakawa niya si A, nag-employ siya ng force. Pero nung nakita siya ulit ni A na kumakain ng balot, wala ng unlawful aggression nun. The unlawful aggression ceased to exist. At sa time na yon, nung inatak na ni A si B, wala ng unlawful aggression. That is considered as retaliation. Ang ginawa niya is plain and simple revenge o paghihiganti. And because of that, hindi na siya makaklaim ng self-defense. Kasi at the time na inatak niya si B na kumakain ng balot, there was no more unlawful aggression. Yan yung sa question natin kanina earlier in this video. Kung saan tinanong natin kung valid ba yung pag-atak sa nahuli na magnanakaw? Valid ba yung pagkuyo? at pagbugbog sa magnanakaw na nahuli. Hindi siya valid kasi at the time na nahuli na yung magnanakaw o yung nanghipo o yung gumawa ng malaswang bagay, wala ng unlawful aggression. The unlawful aggression already ceased to exist. At kapag nag-employ pa kayo ng force at that moment, you are already considered to be the unlawful aggressors. At hindi na yung tao na yon. Ang pagbubugbog sa mga magnanakaw kapag nahuli sila, that is an administration of strict justice. That is no longer legal justice in the strict sense of the word. Kaya nga sila huhuliin para mapipinalize sila. Pero kapag binugbog mo naman sila, then you are already inflicting punishment which is not sanctioned by law. At pwede kang makasuhan yan for physical injuries or even for homicide or murder kapag namatay yung tao na yon. Kaya mag-iingat po kayo. At saka there's a presumption of innocence. Kasi yun sa isang video na napanood ko, pinagbintangan siyang ng hipo. Eh meron naman palang camera na naka-record ng nangyari at hindi naman pala siya hinipuan. And as a result, binugbog yung tao na yon and it was eventually discovered na wala naman pala siyang malaswang ginawa. O ba diba? Binugbog na siya sa kasalanang hindi niya naman ginawa. Next, the unlawful aggression must come from the person who was attacked by the accused. For example, kapag si A and B magkasama and then nakita ni A yung kaaway niya na si C, so si A ngayon bumunot ng patalim o ng kutsilyo para i-stab si C and si C nakita yon, bumunot siya ng baril at pinagbabaril si A at si B, si C ngayon pwede niyang i-invoke ang self-defense against kay A. Kasi si A ay unlawful aggressor. Pero hindi siya makavalidly claim ng self-defense against kay B. Kasi si B, hindi naman siya unlawful aggressor. Again, the unlawful aggression must come from the person who was attacked by the accused. Number six, no unlawful aggression when there is agreement to fight. So kapag nagkasundo ang dalawang tao na mag-away o na magsuntukan o na magbarilan, walang unlawful aggression doon. Kasi in the eyes of the law, both persons are considered as unlawful aggressors. In other words, kapag nagkasundo silang mag-away at merong naunang nag-attack, hindi pwedeng i-claim ng kabilang panig na merong unlawful aggression. That's why he needed to defend himself. Kasi nga, they both agreed to fight. Both of them accepted the challenge to fight. So walang unlawful aggression kasi nga both Both of them are considered as unlawful aggressors. Pero, hindi mag-apply ang rule na to kapag hindi pumayag yung isa. If the other person being challenged did not accept the challenge, then yung isang tao na nag-attack, siya lang ang unlawful aggressor. Yung tao na hindi tumanggap ng challenge, kapag dinefend niya yung sarili niya, he can invoke self-defense. Another thing to remember under number 6 is when there is an agreement to fight on a particular date or on a particular time, if one of them made an attack ahead of time in violation of the agreement, he will be the only one considered as the unlawful aggressor. The other person who accepted the challenge on a particular date can validly defend himself. He can invoke self-defense when he will repel or prevent the attack. Kasi nga ang agreement is on a particular time or date. Kapag hindi sinunod yon, yung tao na nag-attack ahead of time, siya lang ang makonsider as the unlawful aggressor. Number seven, mere threatening attitude is not unlawful aggression. Now dito sa article 285, which is other light threats, kung babasahin natin yung number one, any person who, without being included in the provisions 
of the next preceding article shall threaten another with a weapon or draw such weapon in a quarrel. So kapag yung tao na yon ay nanakot, gumamit siya ng armas or weapon para manakot, then he is liable for other light threats. At kapag ang intention niya ay manakot lang, then that is not considered as an unlawful aggression. Kasi remember, sa unlawful aggression, kailangang actual or imminent. Pag sinabing imminent, it is at the point of happening. So, kapag ang intention niya ay manakot lang, hindi naman talaga siya mag employ ng physical force. At kapag hindi siya nag employ ng physical force, walang unlawful aggression doon when it comes to self-defense. For example, A saw his mortal enemy B who was buying bread in the bake shop. A pulled out his knife and charged towards the direction of B. B saw A, so B drew his gun. When A saw the gun, he stopped and ran away. A filed a criminal case against B for light threat under Article 285. So, pwede niya bang kasuhan si B for light threat? Kasi nga, di ba? Under Article 285, if you shall threaten another with a weapon, you are liable for light threats. So dito sa example natin, si B naglabas siya ng barel. So yung act niya ba ng paglabas ng barel, is that considered as light threat? The answer is no because of Article 285. Kung titignan natin sa Article 285, nakalagay din dito na unless it be in lawful self-defense. So yung ginawa dito ni B, kasi nakita niya na mayroong imminent unlawful aggression, he was just merely defending himself. Kaya bumunot siya ng barel. And therefore, hindi siya magiging liable under Article 285 dahil dito. Unless it be in lawful self-defense. Number eight, the belief of the accused may be considered in determining the existence of unlawful aggression. So yung paniniwala niya ay isa ring factor to consider para malaman kung merong unlawful aggression o wala. Example, A, an army veteran, was using the public toilet to urinate. B, a stranger, approached from behind, pointed a toy gun at A's head, and shouted, Papatayin kita! In just two skillful moves, A successfully disarmed B and karate chopped his neck. B fell down and died. Unknown to A, there was a hidden camera as it was just a prank. So sa example na to, wala naman palang danger sa life ni A. Kasi B was just pulling a prank. Siguro for YouTube or for the internet, he, he wanted to be viral, kaya niya ginawa yun. Since wala namang totoong threat sa life ni A, can A validly invoke self-defense? The answer is yes, because of mistake of fact. No mistake of fact is expressed in the legal maxim, ignorantia facti excusat. Ignorance of a fact is an excuse. So ano bang implication pag merong mistake of fact? An honest mistake of fact destroys the presumption of criminal intent, which arises upon the commission of a felonious act. Kapag gumawa ka ng felonious act, you are presumed to have criminal intent. Pero kapag merong honest mistake of fact, mawawala yung presumption na yun. Ang kailangan nyo lang tandaan sa mistake of fact ay ito. Ito lang yung memorize ko when it comes to mistake of fact para mas madali ninyong maintindihan ang mistake of fact. The act done would have been lawful had the facts been as the accused believed them to be. Kung totoo lang sana yung belief ng accused, if he was just correct in his belief in appreciating the facts of the incident, magiging lawful sana yung ginawa niya. So sa example natin kanina na mayroong panganib sa buhay niya kasi nga, di ba, tinutukan siya ng baril at sinabihan pa siya, papatayin kita. Ang paniniwala niya sa sitwasyon na yon ay nanganganib yung buhay niya. Kaya yung instinct niya is for self-preservation. So ang ginawa niya, siguro sa military training niya, instinct na ang nag-kick in, kinarati chop niya yung leg at namatay yung tao na yon. Although it was just a prank, pero sa paniniwala niya, talagang nasa peligro yung buhay niya. So had the facts been as the accused believed them to be, the act done would have been lawful. So sa sitwasyon na yon, hindi naman talaga criminal yung intent niya. Ang intensyon niya lang talaga ay ipagtanggol yung sarili niya kasi based on his belief, nanganganib yung buhay niya. Let us now go to the second requisite or the second element, which is reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel it. Dito sa reasonable necessity, there are two aspects. First, necessity of the course of action. And second, necessity of the means used. Pag sinabi nating necessity of the course of action, we are referring to the necessity to act. It answers the question, is there a necessity to act in that situation? For example, Someone attacked you with a knife but you were carrying a firearm and you shot him. So sa case ba na to, was it necessary for you to act? The answer is yes. Kasi nga, meron nang nag a sa'yo. Someone is already attacking you with a knife. Therefore, there is a necessity to act in this situation. Second, 
Someone attacked you with a knife but you blocked it and the assailant ran away. You chased him and killed him. So dito ba sa situation na to, was there a necessity to act? Was there a necessity on your part to chase him and kill him? So the answer is no. Kasi nga, we mentioned earlier that retaliation is not self-defense. Sa case na to, there was no longer an unlawful aggression. Pero hinabol mo pa rin siya at pinatay mo. Therefore, in this case, there is no necessity to act. Number two, necessity of the means employed. Is it necessary for you to use that particular means? Kinakailangan ba na gumamit ka ng ganyan na pamamaraan? For example, someone attacked you with a knife but you were carrying a firearm and you shot him. So sa situation ba na to, was it necessary for you to use that particular means? Yung paggamit ng baril at pagbaril sa kanya. The answer is yes. Kasi nga, knife is a deadly weapon and there is danger to your life and you are just merely defending yourself. Another example, someone shouted at you and slapped you in the face. Feeling angry, you shot him in the head. So was there a necessity for you to use that particular means? Yung pagbaril sa kanya sa ulo. The answer is no. Napag-aralan natin kanina na a slap on the face constitutes unlawful aggression. So merong unlawful aggression sa case na to. Pero yung means ba na ginamit mo, was it reasonably necessary? Yung pagbaril sa kanya? The answer is no. Take note that perfect equality between the weapons used is not required. So kung ang gamit niya sa pag-attack sa'yo ay kutsilyo, hindi mo kailangan maghanap din ng kutsilyo. Or kapag gumamit siya ng baril, you are not required to find a gun. Kasi nga, perfect equality between the weapons used is not required. Not material commensurability but only rational equivalence. Pag sinabing material commensurability, kailangan equal. For example, kapag sinuntok ka, kailangan gamitan mo rin ang kamao. Kapag sinipa ka, kailangan mo rin sipain. Kapag ina-attack ka gamit ang kutsilyo, kailangan ding kutsilyo ang gamitin mo. But that is not required. Material commensurability is not required. But only rational equivalence. Pag sinabing rational equivalence, you have to take into account a lot of factors like the emergency of the situation, your instinct that will kick in during that critical moment, and imminent danger of the situation. So yun nga yun ang titignan. Kapag binubugbog ka ng tatlong tao, wala silang gamit na patalim, walang weapons used. Pero since madami sila, you are in a critical situation kasi magiging deadly yung blows nila kasi madami sila. And therefore, hindi mo kailangang gantihan ng kamao din o ng sipa. Kapag meron kang deadly weapon, like for example, knife or gun, pwede mong gamitin sa kanila. Kasi nga, because of the emergency, the instinct, and because of the imminent danger. So the reasonableness of the means employed will depend on the nature and quality of the weapons, the physical condition, character, and size. Take note dito sa self-defense under paragraph 1, defense of relatives under paragraph 2, and defense of strangers under paragraph 3 of article 11 or the justifying circumstances, pareho sila ng first and second elements. Parehong kailangan ng unlawful aggression at reasonable necessity of the means employed to prevent or repel it. Magkaiba lang ang kanilang third element. Let us now go to the third element or the third requirement which is lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself. Now what do we mean when we say provocation? It is an action or speech held likely to prompt physical retaliation. So ang provocation, isang bagay na ginawa mo o sinabi mo na nag ng galit sa isang tao, na nag ng negative reaction sa recipient nito. At kailangan hindi lang basta-basta provocation. The provocation must be sufficient. Pag sinabing sufficient provocation, the provocation must be proportionate to the act of aggression and adequate to stir the aggressor to its commission. So, kailangan proportionate siya sa aggression mo. Kailangan because of your provocation, kaya nagkaroon ng unlawful aggression sa part ng victim. Dito sa third requirement or element, lack of sufficient provocation on the part of the person defending himself, present siya when no provocation at all was given by the person defending. Kapag wala namang provocation on the part of the person na nag sa sarili niya, then the third requirement is present and that person defending himself can validly invoke self-defense. Present din ang third requirement sa number two. Even if a provocation was given, it was not sufficient. So kahit pa prinovoke ng person na nag sa kanyang sarili, kahit pa prinovoke niya yung unlawful aggressor, present pa rin ang third requirement kapag yung provocation na yun ay hindi sufficient. Kasi nga, kailangan yung provocation, dapat sufficient siya. When the provocation is not sufficient, present ang third requirement. At kapag hindi sufficient ang provocation, then the person defending himself can invoke self-defense. Number three, present pa rin ang third requirement 
even if the provocation was sufficient, it was not given by the person defending himself. So, kailangan yung tao na, for example, pinatay niya yung unlawful aggressor. Kailangan yung tao na nag sa sarili niya, hindi sa kanya nang galing yung sufficient provocation. For example, sa kasama niya lang. So, kapag hindi sa kanya galing yung sufficient provocation, kahit sa kasama niya pa, he can still validly invoke self-defense. And then number four, present pa rin ang third requirement or element if the provocation was not proximate and immediate to the act of aggression. For example, si A, sinampal niya si B nung morning. And then pagkahapon, nakita ni B si A. Dahil sa sinampal siya nung morning, si B, kumuha siya ng panaksak at sasaksakin niya sana si A. Pero si A, mabilis na nakabunot ng baril and binaril niya si B. Ang question is, meron bang sufficient provocation sa part niya? Although sinampal niya, and that is considered as sufficient provocation, pero yung provocation naman yun, hindi siya proximate and immediate sa act of aggression. Kasi morning siya sinampal. Kailangang morning din yung act of aggression. Kapag meron ng lapse of time, hindi na proximate and immediate to the act of aggression yung provocation. Kaya present pa rin ang third requirement. And he can validly invoke self-defense. Question, what will happen if one or some of the requisites of self-defense are not present? So meron tayong three requirements or elements. Papaano kung merong kulang sa requisites or sa elements? Kapag ang kulang ay ang unlawful aggression or yung number one, self-defense cannot be validly invoked. There is no self-defense to speak of, whether complete or incomplete. Kasi unlawful aggression is a condition sine qua non. Important ang unlawful aggression sa self-defense. It is the foundation. Kapag walang unlawful aggression, walang self-defense, whether complete or incomplete. No self-defense accused is criminally liable. Papaano kung first element lang ang meron, which is unlawful aggression? The answer is... It is only an ordinary mitigating circumstance under Article 13. Ito yung mitigating circumstances. Now, dito sa Article 13, Paragraph 1, those mentioned in the preceding chapter when all the requisites necessary to justify are not attended. So, hindi present lahat ng requisites. Ang effect ay, it will just be considered as ordinary mitigating circumstance under Article 13. Now, what is the implication of an ordinary mitigating circumstance when it comes to penalties? For example, when the penalty provides two indivisible penalties, like reclusion perpetua to death, at merong ordinary mitigating circumstance, ang penalty ngayon ay reclusion perpetua, which is the lower penalty. So, ang i na penalty ay yung lower penalty because of the presence of an ordinary mitigating circumstance. What about divisible penalty having three periods? Kapag merong three periods, for example, sa reclusion temporal, because re reclusion temporal is a divisible penalty, then you impose the minimum period. So, dito, reclusion temporal in its minimum period. That is kung merong ordinary mitigating circumstance. So kanina, isang requirement or element lang present, which is unlawful aggression. Ngayon naman, paano kung dalawa ang present? Paano kung present ang first and second or first and third? Ano ang magiging effect? It will be considered as a privileged mitigating circumstance under Article 69. And if you read Article 69, which is penalty to be imposed when the crime committed is not wholly excusable, nakalagay dito na, the penalty to be imposed will be lowered by 1 or 2 degrees. Yan ang effect ng privilege mitigating circumstance. Yan ang effect kapag present ang dalawa out of 3 requisites sa self-defense. Nakalagay dito na lack of some of the conditions required to justify the same under Article 11. Pero kailangang majority of such conditions be present. So, kailangan majority. Kapag merong three requisites, naturally, ang majority niyan ay dalawa. Two out of three. So, kung merong majority, then the penalty will be lowered by one or two degrees. For example, sa homicide under Article 249, the imposable penalty is reclusion temporal. Sinabi natin na kapag present ang dalawang requisites, magiging privilege mitigating circumstance. And ang effect niya ay, you lower the penalty by one or two degrees. Now, it is subject to the discretion of the judge kung 1 degree ba or 2 degrees ang ilo-lower niya. So, dito, ang 1 degree lower ng reclusion temporal, we have prison mayor. Ang 2 degrees lower is prison correctional. So, it depends on the judge whether he will impose prison mayor or prison correctional. Question, in what case is the accused not criminally liable even in the absence of any of the conditions for self-defense? Now remember, dito sa privilege mitigating circumstance at dito sa ordinary mitigating circumstance, liable. Kasi nga, it's an incomplete self-defense. 
Kapag incomplete self-defense, magiging liable ka pa rin. For example, pinatay mo yung tao. Homicide. Kapag present ang isa out of three, which is unlawful aggression lang, ordinary mitigating circumstance. Maka-avail ka under Article 13, Paragraph 1. Pero liable ka pa rin. Kung present naman ang dalawa, 2 out of 3, liable ka pa rin sa homicide pero the penalty will be lowered by 1 or 2 degrees. Pero liable ka pa rin. Now that is the effect of an incomplete self-defense. Now dito sa question natin, in what case is the accused not criminally liable even in the absence of any of the conditions for self-defense? So dito may kulang. Pero ang nakalagay sa question is, hindi ka criminally liable kahit may kulang. So anong case ba yon? The answer can be found under Republic Act 9262 or Anti-Violence Against Women and Their Children Act of 2004. And we are referring to the Battered Woman Syndrome. Now under Section 26 of Republic Act 9262 or VAUSI, the Battered Woman Syndrome as a defense, nakalagay dito na, victim survivors who are found by the courts to be suffering from Battered Woman Syndrome do not incur criminal and civil liability and eto na yung sagot natin notwithstanding the absence of any of the elements of justifying circumstances now meron tayong tinatawag na cycle of violence there are three phases of cycle of violence the first is tension building phase the second acute battering incident and the final phase is the tranquil loving phase no ano-ano ba tong mga phases na to first is the tension building phase dito minor battering occurs it could be verbal or slight physical abuse or another form of hostile behavior. So dito, nagsisimula sa maliit. Siguro sampal lang o konting sipa, konting suntok, pero not necessarily physical. Pwede ring verbal, merong verbal abuse. A second phase, which is acute battering incident, is said to be characterized by brutality, destructiveness, and sometimes death. So kung sa number one, medyo sampol-sampol lang, sa number two, Dito na yung todo-todo. So talagang ito na yung matinding bugbugan. Talagang the wife is mauled, beaten to a pulp, beaten black and blue. Talagang kawawa yung wife dito. And then sa number three, the final stage which which is tranquil loving phase. It's from the word itself loving, a period wherein the couple experience profound relief. So sa stage nito, na-realize ng husband yung ginawa niya, mag apologize siya ngayon. Magmamakaawa, you know yung usual lines, I'm sorry, I will not do it again. It was not me, I was just drunk, or I was just overcome by passion, and so on and so forth. You know, usual excuse or reasons. At dahil sa pagbibigyan siya ng asawa niya, babalik na naman sa another cycle of violence. Magre-repeat na naman yan. So ang landmark case dito, kung saan diniscuss ng Supreme Court ang battered woman syndrome ay sa case ng People versus Henosa. Ito yung issue doon, yung battered woman syndrome. And dito sa landmark case na to, there are three important points na sinabi ng Supreme Court para maka-avail ng defense on the basis of battered woman syndrome under RA 9262. So take note, hindi porket binugbog na yung asawa or subject na siya sa physical abuse, meron na kaagad battered woman syndrome. You have to comply with these requisites. Kailangang present itong mga requirements sa to. Number one, there must be at least two battering episodes. So pag sinabi nating battering episodes, ang tinutukoy niya dito ay yung acute battering incident. So naturally, nakaikot na siya. So nagsimula siya sa tension building phase, pumunta sa acute battering incident, so merong one. Then, tranquil loving phase, and then bumalik siya sa tension building phase, and then pumunta ulit siya sa acute battering incident. So two, there must be at least two battering incidents or episodes between the appellant and her intimate partner. Number two, the final acute battering episode preceding the killing of the batterer must have produced in the battered person's mind an actual fear of an imminent harm. So ito na yung tinutukoy natin na imminent unlawful aggression. So yung final na acute battering episode, ito, acute battering episode, dahil dito, nag-create siya sa mind ng wife o ng babae na mayroong danger sa life niya. At dahil doon, sa number 3, at the time of killing, the batterer must have posed probable, not necessarily immediate and actual, grave harm to the accused. Kung sa self-defense, merong actual at saka imminent, dito sa number 3, not necessarily immediate, di ba? But merely probable. Kasi nga, sa isip ng babae, talagang praning na siya. Talagang sa pagkakaalam niya, meron ng danger sa life niya at saka sa limb niya. Takot na takot 
natakot na siya. That is now the battered woman syndrome. For example, Juanito was married to Mariana. One afternoon, they quarreled over who was going to pick up their son. Feeling upset, Juanito went out and when he returned late that night, he was drunk. He saw Mariana and grabbed her hair and threw her against the wall. Because of the impact, her head was bleeding. He punched her face and kicked her five times. Realizing what he had done, Juanito carried her and laid her on the bed while saying, I'm sorry my love, forgive me. This will not happen again, I promise. Mariana could not move for an hour. When she got up, she took a knife and stabbed her sleeping husband to death. Question, can the woman or can the wife validly invoke self-defense on the basis of battered woman syndrome under Republic Act number no. 9262 or VAUSI? Was she suffering from battered woman syndrome in this case? The answer is no. Kasi if we go back to the landmark case of People versus Hinosa, the number one requirement is there must be at least two battering episodes. So sa case ba na to, meron bang two battering episodes? There was none. There was only one battering episode yung gabing yon. And the third requisite is that at the time of the killing, the batterer must have posed probable, not necessarily immediate and actual, grave harm to the accused. Kung titignan nyo yung case, natutulog na yung husband at doon niya sinaksak yung husband. Yung natutulog na yung husband, he was no longer posing any probable grave harm to the accused pero pinatay niya pa rin. And since hindi na comply ang first at saka third requirement, walang battered woman syndrome dito. She was not suffering from battered woman syndrome and therefore walang self-defense. That's it for part 1. Meron po tayong part 2 ng justifying circumstances under Article 11.